the Amazon. It is a place of mythic proportions, but its proportions are no myth. It is second in length only to the Nile, but in volume of water, wildlife, and plant life, it is second to none. And the people? They have learned to coexist with the most powerful river on earth. Our visit to the Amazon was truly a trip back in time, to places still beyond reach of the electric and telephone line. Our time machine, a remarkable vessel built on the banks of the river, La Amatista. Aboard, scientists, environmentalists, and volunteers from the Florida Aquarium and the Atlanta Zoo. What's running off into this is nice natural water. What runs off the Hillsborough River is something from basically fertilizers. <laughs> The group was led by aquarium director Jeff Swanigan. While La Amatista was mighty comfortable, he allowed us little time aboard. With the ship's twin chase boats, we explored some of the river's multitude of tributaries and occasional villages. After all, we'd come on a fact-finding mission, and fact was, we had much to learn from the river and its people, both by day and night. Uh, there was a larger kingfisher that we have around here, the, uh, it's called the ring, the ring kingfisher. Guide Juan Fajata amazed us when he snatched a caiman, first cousin to Florida's alligator, from the river by hand. Jeff then gave us a caiman lesson. See the ridge across his eyes right here? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the thing you don't you wouldn't find that ridge right there, but also he has three eyelids. He'll have an upper eyelid and a lower eyelid like like we all would. And he has a third one that goes across the eye. Let's see if you'll show it. Now, do you see how quickly that opened? Lesson over. Mr. Cayman went home. Our week on the river brought us wonderfully close to its wildlife more abundant than anywhere I've ever been, and gave us a much better understanding of its people, as self-sufficient as any I've ever seen. By our standards, certainly, the standard of living is low, but as Jeff suggested, we could learn much from the way they live. We've just traveled for miles and miles and never see a single piece of trash. And we see how they handle the floods here. They don't try to handle them. I mean, they let the floods manage them, and we try to manage the floods. <laughs> and we're usually not very successful at it. And so here they've adapted to, to the more natural water systems where we, we haven't. The people of the Amazon have adapted to the rise and fall and flooding of the river in a variety of ways. They build stilt houses, which simply become islands unto themselves when the river overflows its banks. Sometimes more than a dozen people will live in a home such as this, along with all their pets and livestock, and a stockpile of food to last for months. The homes of others float on large balsa wood rafts held in place by tall wooden pods or pilings upon which they ride up and down. And others still build their villages on high ground well inland from the river's banks. But while the river remains comparatively unscathed, the same cannot be said of its watershed, the rainforest. The trees, including the mighty Seba, once the object of worship, are being torn from the canopy to become a commodity. Giant old growth trees sawn into enormous segments lie stacked as irrefutable evidence of the forest's fate. And as the forest goes, so goes the culture that grew up within it. The shaman are old, and few young people seem interested in learning the medicinal secrets of the plants. And there are millions of different species, most of which are unknown even to the shaman, much less modern medicine. The people of the river clear only small plots of land for their own agricultural needs, Destruction such as this is not the work of individuals, but industries. Perhaps the rainforest's best hope is in an industry that celebrates rather than decimates the environment. You know, besides 
bring in your money, your dollars also bring culture. One of our guides, Rainy Kukinche, explained to us how tourism is helping to save the trees. But most of the words I speak, I learn from tourists. And many things, also we, we learn about conservation. You know, and uh, in, uh, in our schools, conservation is just starting. You know, nobody tells you that it's bad to, to cut all the trees. It's, nobody tells you you should stop killing the animals. We don't, we don't learn this in school. I learned all about these things since I started working tourism. Oh, yes. Rivers have much in common, and among the members of our expedition, Laura Delise of the Hillsborough River Greenways Task Force. As our adventure drew to a close, she felt a sense of reassurance about the future of this river and those at home. I think the vision that it can still be done, that you can still protect a watershed and that there are ways of doing it, and I think they might have a heads up on us in terms of the knowledge that they have. Costa Rica, a country rich in rainforests, and of all the nations in the world, none has set a greater percentage of its land aside for national parks and preservation. But Costa Rica is a small country. It accounts for but a fraction of the world's rainforests, and parks and preserves don't mean total protection. We got great laws, but we got nobody to enforce them. American expatriate Dr. Jim McClellan came to Costa Rica because of the environment. The country's the size of West Virginia. Okay, 30% of it is reserved or preserved. 30% of West Virginia is not very big. Open your hands. Woo! Open your hands. To protect its rainforests, the Costa Rican government is trying to make them more profitable as a source of tourism than a source of rare and exotic woods. And to that end, some rather unique forms of access to the rainforest have been created for tourists. <laughs> Back in the 70s, Costa Rica actually had 70% of the whole area pretty much covered by forest. In the 80s, that 70% went to 25%. So, Dr. Raul Rivero is Director of Education at Selby Gardens in Sarasota. It is one of our nation's premier centers of botanical research, and Selby scientists are working closely with the Costa Rican people to help them preserve their remaining rainforests and unlock the myriad of secrets they hold. Dr. Rivero says the key to saving the forests is simple economics. The trees are worth more to the people growing in a forest than going to a mill. Ecotourism is probably uh, the highest uh, source of income for Costa Rica. And I think it would be an ideal way to promote conservation. To that end, Selby has established an intern program to help develop young Costa Rican scientists who can return to their country and act as environmental ambassadors. We traveled to the town of Monte Verde to meet one of them, Gabriel Barboso. He has established the smallest orchid garden in the world. Oh, the garden isn't small, but the orchids are. Gabriel speaks very little English, but Raul says orchids speak volumes about our need to save the rainforests because we don't understand first at all what are going to be the next sources for the cure of cancer, for example. Might be in there. One of those orchids might be the, the, the future cure of cancer or many other uh, kind of serious diseases that we have. <laughs> oh man, this is amazing. I love it. Adios. Ecotourism in Costa Rica can be pretty exciting, but it doesn't have to be this exciting. There are other more conventional ways of getting around while still staying high above the ground. There are canopy hikes you can take that include several suspension bridges through or above the canopy, and miles of trails along the floor of the forest. And when you get tired of walking, you can take an aerial tram through different levels of the canopy. 
It was on this ride that we met Martha Mora. The area we're passing right now, this is a secondary forest. As you can see, the very short vegetation tells you that uh, big trees were cut or something happened with the big trees a long time ago and the, the vegetation is growing back. There's a young environmentalist who hopes to someday intern at Selby herself. Martha's passion for the ecology of her country is inspiring to everyone she meets. And fortunately, she's meeting lots of school children. About twice or three times per week, we bring uh, big groups of, of, of students to spend the day in here to learn about, the, about nature. And to, we try to share with them as much as possible and to plant the, the seed of conservation. Many of those seeds come from Selby Gardens in the form of instructional flyers, which are distributed by newspapers to school teachers throughout Costa Rica. For every school teacher you train and you provide resources, you have to multiply that by 25. That means the number of students that actually is per classroom. In that way, we can actually have as much impact as possible in the whole country. The Costa Rican people are highly patriotic. Children learn to take pride in their country at a very early age. Raul believes that with understanding and the next generation, that pride will include a strong commitment to the environment. Most of those students, for sure, they live in, the, in, in one area, then they have the rainforest close by, and they probably haven't realized how important they are. I think it's a great message for the next generation. Now we understand exactly how fragile those ecosystems are and how beneficial they are for us.